Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Collin County Board of Commissioners April 22nd, 2014 work session. And Nate Bennett, who shadowed me today, and I would like to call this meeting uh, to order and remind you to turn off all cell phones, next tails, and pagers as it does uh, uh, interrupt the uh, production. Uh, for our invocation and pledge, uh, today we have Pastor Robbie Finley, Director of Fallen Fellowship of Christian <coughs> Athletes, to uh, bring a prayer. If you'll remember these young people uh, in, in that prayer, Robbie. And uh, would you stand with me if you're able? Thank you. Thank God for letting me be here. Uh, real quick before I do, I had a few jokes. Uh, that I was going to speak about, especially after the last time I was here, I had no idea some of the stuff y'all are facing. I've learned more since, so, um, you know, but I'm, in a lot of the company, I'll save some of the shows uh, for later. And, uh, thank y'all for letting me come, and uh, just guys know that we're praying for y'all. Uh, there's a lot of people praying for y'all, regardless of, you know, what some of the feelings are and everything. It's uh, y'all are in a tough spot, so, uh, and we pray that, uh, that y'all will continue to seek his face and all that y'all do and y'all make decisions. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you for these young people, Father, that are uh, coming around and shattering some of our leaders in our community, Father. And we pray that um, as you prepare them and, and set the stage for them in, in the future, Father, that you will help us lead them well. Father, we pray that uh, we can leave a legacy for them to build upon. And Father, we pray that you'll just continue to um, grow them and uh, bless our education system, Father, in Fallen County and, and beyond as, um, as these young people come up through it. Father, um, they're at a tender age. And over the next four or five years, Father, they're going to see some of the biggest changes they'll ever see in their lives and go through some of the, um, I guess, the challenges, uh, biggest challenges they'll go through in their life as well. So we pray that, Father, you'll help them uh, make good decisions and resist temptations that will come their way. Pray for the leaders in our community, Father, that are faced with a lot of things and uh, a lot of stuff with the, the businesses and the airports and all this stuff, Father, and the, the things of this world that they're faced with, uh, Father, to try and make this uh, community a better place. And we know that there's opposition out there, Father, in all things, and, and I don't know all of it, Father. I know I don't. But God, I just want to lift up these leaders, Father and ask you to hold them close to your face and that you'll breathe on them and in them and through them and help them make the best decisions for this county, Father, that where you can have the glory for it all. And Father, may we all see lives transformed for your glory through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Another you know pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Minutes to March 27, 2014 Leadership Conference Minutes and the March 28, 2014 Leader Conference Minutes, the April 8, 2014 Work Session Minutes, and the April 8, 2014 board meeting minutes are available for your review. Now, the Board of Commissioners would like to recognize Civic Youth Day. Uh, the YMCA of Georgia sponsors the Georgia Center for Civic Engagement. Part of their mission is to educate students and how government works and to teach good and engaged citizenship. These students spend the day with department heads, elected officials, to become better acquainted with the daily activities of local government. So, uh, if you would, let's hear a hand for all those students. Today. Thank you. I have uh, Janae Bennett. I'm going to hand the keys over here shortly and I'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Janae is a South Holland senior. Uh, she uh, <coughs> is going to Bernal University and only two hours of me shadowing her she won a full scholarship to Bernal for volleyball. So aren't y'all proud of that? Now if you're here and you're shadowing someone 
Uh, if I would, uh, let's start on this side of the room. If you'll stand up and introduce, say your name, and who you're shadowing today. Um, my name is Brock and Bates. I'm um, the sergeant and the captain. Thank you. I'm Preston James, and I'm shadowing Ann. Ann Litton. Okay. I'm going to be ignoring poor, and I'm shadowing Mr. Michael Justice for a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm Dante Bunwin, I'm shadowing Kevin for the Toy Financing. I'm Brett Black, I'm also uh, shadowing Tadpo with uh, Financing. Uh, you got two. I'm Brett Anderson, and I'm shadowing Mr. Lowe with Information Technology. I'm Samantha Donato, I'm from DOT, I'm supposed to be with Scott Greenwood with Bill with Erica and Michael. Stay behind me. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Jacob Hermans, and I'm also with uh, the DOT, so we're supposed to be shadowing Mr. Green today. Supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's right here in front of you. My name's Taylor McCoy. I'm Madeline Bailey, and we're shadowing the tax assessor, Mr. James, and his assistant. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Kelly Hall. I'm with Harm High School, and I'm shadowing Mayor Doris Devey today. I'm Brianna Dinkowski, and I'm shadowing Brian Adler. And I'm Chandler Brown, and I'm shadowing Eric Gary Gulich. That's some big pantyhose to fill. You've got another one in the back. Yes, sir. I'm Tina James, and I'm shadowing the Our photographer? I'm David Henry, I'm shadowing Jody Barnes. Okay, fantastic. Anybody else? Well, uh, this is a great day. Uh, we're, we're excited about what you do and what you'll learn today. And uh, it's a great experience. So thank you all for this. It's, uh, it's a wonderful day. Uh, under announcements, the Board of Commissioners would like to recognize uh, and present the Public Safety Appreciation Award to Deputy Chief Joy Telford for the Holland County Fire Department. Joe, would you come to us? Been with Pauling County Fire Department since 1992. He began his volunteer career and has been promoted through the ranks to Deputy Chief. He came all the way up from a volunteer, firefighter one, two, three, lieutenant, captain, all the way up to Deputy Chief. Uh, Joey has 22 years of service. He is a cum laude graduate from Columbia Southern University. Recently, within well, probably the last three weeks, he has received his Bachelor of Science in Fire Administration. Deputy Chief Joey Pepper oversees operations unit of the fire department and assists Chief Herewood with the media splice long-term planning for the fire department and the EMA. He also assists me with EMA planning, training, disasters. Every disaster he's right along my side. He obtains strong leadership skills with the ability to manage a large department through mentoring and guidance in a professional manner. <clears throat> In addition, he is involved with participation and coordination of the department and community events such as Public Safety Appreciation Day, which he serves on the board. He serves on Trigger Treat Village, departmental fundraisers for the Relief Fund. He is admired by his personnel and dedication to his family, his education, and his career. He is most deserving of recognition today, and it is my honor to present Joey Pelper to you in appreciation of Public Safety Day. Comrades, a step here for a photo moment. You guys yeah. join us. <laughs> guys, come forward. Melissa, come up here. Come on. Oh, that's Melissa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Commissioners, um, just to begin, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has identified a commission meeting as, quote, a, uh, a limited public forum, which is a forum for certain groups of speakers and a forum for the discussion of certain topics. As you all are aware, our current Citizens Wishing to Speak ordinance uh, allows members of the public to speak for five minutes at the end of the work in regular sessions. In order to do that, a citizen wishing to speak has to submit the name and the topic that they're going to speak on uh, by 5 o'clock on the Friday, immediately preceding the board meeting. At the last board meeting, I believe it was Commissioners Palnell and Graham, uh, I'll keep going, uh, Commissioners Palnell and Graham, who had indicated uh, that there was a desire to expand, to expand the speaking deadline from, five, from Friday at 5 until noon on the Monday before the next board meeting. The advantage to that that was voiced by the Commission is that it would allow interested citizens, once they obtain an agenda, to have additional time to review the agenda over the weekend, and upon completing that review, they would still have until Monday at noon in order to sign up to speak. Since that time, we've considered this proposal, and right now there's an idea for an additional proposal uh, beyond that. The proposal for consideration right now is for the complete elimination of submission deadlines. Uh, instead, the board would allow citizens to sign up to speak for the citizens wishing to speak portion uh, up until the time of the meeting, the day of the meeting. This would give citizens an additional three and a half to four days to consider the agenda and make the determination as to whether or not they want to speak. The proposal would also limit discussion, limit citizens wishing to speak topics to those items that are listed as old business or new business. As I envision it practically, a citizen would appear sometime prior to the meetings, uh, such as this morning. Uh, they would sign up on a sign-in sheet indicating their name in indicating which agenda item they wanted to speak on. In terms of positioning, it would likely occur uh, on the agenda sometime probably after committee and department head reports, but that of course is entirely up to y'all. This is simply a proposal and I submit it to y'all uh, now for your discussion and thoughts on that. So we'll open up and have some discussion. Um, I'll start. Okay. All right. I would like to, uh, one of the things I would like to see, I think that part's a great idea, and that you can come in and sign in, you discuss the topic, uh, you, you talk about a, a, a subject that's on the agenda, and um, I would like to see during the voting sessions, which would be the 2 o'clock meeting on the second Tuesday and the 7 o'clock meeting on the 
fourth Tuesday of the month, I would like to see the citizens be able to speak before we vote on that item. Um, that way, you know, if, to, if somebody can be there at the two or they can be there at the seven, they haven't had a chance to talk to us before. Maybe there's something they got to like to say that would allow us to hear their input, and then we would later on in the meeting vote instead of voting and then listening to them later. So I'd like to see that happen. I think that'd be great. Which, which was the intent when I talked to Jason was that, um, and, and I gave him some examples that I've experienced. I know in the city of Powder Springs, also in the <coughs> city meetings that I attend, that there is a public comment period before you start. And you walk up, you sign up, and you can speak to any item that is on the agenda. That is the purpose for us to hear pertaining to the item on the agenda. It's not a public forum, but they can speak and, and state whether they're for or against, or questions, comments, but they can speak to the item that's before us. But the intent would be at any of our meetings, at the work session or at a voting meeting. Um, it, Again, this citizen wishing to speak policy that is here, it was here long before we ever got it. Uh, and it was, you know, it's an attempt to give a voice, but it's also limited. One of the issues that I didn't realize until Jason had actually drafted the change, that part of the difficulty, the way the ordinance is written, that when you place your name as a citizen wishing to speak, you actually become part of the agenda. So every time somebody adds, you got to put out another official agenda. So you got to repost it uh, on the website, on the door, you got to send everybody copies. And that's not the whole intent. The intent is to allow citizens to speak to topics that are on our agenda. Now, you know, one limit to that is if we made a decision three months ago, it's not going to allow you to come speak to that topic uh, because it's already passed. But it's anything that is on the current agenda prior to a vote is the intent of the policy. It makes a lot more sense, a lot more logical to have a citizen speak before we vote than just wrap it up after we vote. But on non-agenda items, uh, the gentleman in the audience, John Hyden, who spoke on just healing in the county, that's not an agenda item, but I've benefited from the words of his and others that want to speak uh, just on a, a general topic. Now, I have talked to people around the state where their uh, meetings just turn into hours of people talking, and I don't think that's going to uh, help us out any even in this, I mean, you're still limited on time. You still got to sign in. Uh, my proposal was strictly for what Jason's talking about is instead of extending the time for citizens wishing to speak, it is to place this in. Whether we do away with citizens wishing to speak, as you said, where John Hyde came and talked, or that kind of thing, it's up to us, but my thing is there ought to be a public comment time for agenda items. A bit of goal of what Jason has said. I think the public comment time is great and I think we should, that's something we should do. It gives us folks an opportunity to speak before we vote. They can come in and sign in. Um, however, I would still like to see the other part that we've allowed, and I would like us to allow them to have till Monday at noon. Um, and that may be an issue with some people, but <clears throat> this is the only this is the only time that the five of us can get together, and it's the only time that the citizens can come and talk to us in a, in a group. I mean that's it. That's the that's the sunshine law, and um, so I don't want to take that away. And I know the controversial issue that we've been having the last six months has um, you know brought up a lot of people discussing mm -hmm. things. However, I think for the most part everything's been everybody's been respectful, and it's not like we've had ten people come up to speak. 
and this has probably been the most controversial issue that we've had in this county in forever. And so I think it would still be good for us to have that and give until noon, and, they, and then they're on the agenda, and that's the cutoff. And um, then they can speak, and those non-agenda items would be, we would listen to those citizens at the end of the meeting. But if if uh, if they have if they can speak on an agenda item without coming forward, there is no need to extend that time. If they can speak on a, an agenda item, I mean, once they have it, I mean, five minutes beforehand, they can decide they want to come speak. Now, far as extending the time to noon on Monday. Based on the public comment, public uh, citizens wishing to speak, you don't have to pick agenda items. So there's no need for the agenda to limit and us to change, continue to change that agenda. Because if you want to be a citizen wishing to speak, it doesn't have to be on the agenda. It doesn't matter if it's there. You can call up and say, hey, I want to speak on this agenda and tell them your topic and be on there. So. You eliminate all of this back and forth. You eliminate uh, the issue of everybody watching for it to come out and deciding if they want to come on. I mean, for instance, Mr. Coggins is going to be on today. He's talking about a topic that's not on the agenda. I mean, he could decide on Monday or on the Monday before or the Friday or up into a deadline, and that way she can, when she posts the agenda, the agenda is done. It's going to be the agenda. Cobb County uh, has two uh, public comment time that seems to work well for them. They have a limited number of people that can uh, speak in the first part of their meeting, and they have a limited number of people who can uh, speak at the end of the meeting. So it's another uh, model uh, to look at. Any, any other? Yeah, and I, I'm good with that. I just, I, I think they, they come up, they sign in, they put the topic down, put on the agenda. They're allowed to speak on the agenda item before we vote. And, um, but I still want the citizens to be able to come talk about other issues that have in the county. And those, that would be another talk of time. Yeah, I, mean, however, I don't have a problem with that, but just don't extend the deadline. Then, then, then however that works is good. Okay. I know what to do. Well, I think I've got my directive, so I've got uh, a resolution drafted. Uh, my intention is not for the evening meeting, but for the next meeting. Right. And there'll be more discussion. Uh, there's no consent agenda, no old business. Under new business, discuss action to adopt resolution 14 11, repealing the county excise tax on cell use storage our consumption energy. Jason. I'll recall back in 2013, the Georgia General Assembly uh, began phasing out what is known as the statewide energy excise tax. It is a tax that's placed upon uh, those entities that use energy in the manufacturing of tangible personal items, i.e. goods. Uh, back in 2013, the state's going to phase it out year by year over a four-year period. And in conjunction, the state passed legislation which authorized the counties and the cities to impose the tax back in at the local level. Back in December of 2012, in Resolution 12-47, the Board of Commissioners imposed uh, the tax for the unincorporated areas of Baldwin County. I believe both the cities of Dallas and Hiram have also imposed the energy excise tax within their municipalities. Having reviewed the 2013 collection rate, uh, the 2013 amount of collections, which I believe totaled out uh, at right around $3,000 for 2013, uh, the commissioners uh, that I've spoken with have expressed a desire to repeal this tax given the low collection rate and hopefully make Paulding County a better destination and more appealing for manufacturing businesses that are going to consider our county as a place to locate. And so this resolution essentially repeals that tax. It will not affect what Dallas and Hiram are doing. That is completely within their jurisdictions. 
Uh, yeah. Actual 2013 was thirty-six hundred dollars, which was a quarter of the reduction. So it would mean that what is that fourteen thousand dollars once it's fully implemented. Uh, but I know in talking with Jamie, Jamie Gilbert that one of the questions in any state prospect you get is, do you have the excise tax on energy from manufacturing? It's a big question. It's a big thing. It's not a lot of money to us. We're not like Barco County that has a power plant and they get the tax on coal. You know, it's not a big revenue source for us. So our job, our goal is to bring industry here. So. Jamie, if you come up just for a second and, and uh, talk about that. One of the things we looked at uh, when we studied this is we had no idea uh, what kind of taxes we were talking about. We didn't know if we had to raise property tax. So we kept this in place so we could study for a period of time. And even at that time, uh, it took Georgia Power uh, and it took Greystone quite a long period of time to tell us what the impact would be. Uh, so we looked at it, studied it, and it seems like uh, we need to get it step with the state. And uh, Jamie, if you'd address that. Yes, I, I, thank you. Gentlemen, it's, it's imperative that we do everything we can as we try to bring industry into Paulding County to improve our business climate and show the business community that this is a truly business friendly location. This tax, while it may be small right now, is very symbolic in, in terms of showing businesses, both the ones that are here and the new companies that we're looking to recruit, that this is a community that wants their production facility in Paulding County. And, and I think that uh, Commissioner Graham brought up a good point when he mentioned Marto. There are some other counties that have developed their industrial base to such an extent that they are so dependent right now on getting that sales tax revenue on energy that they can't afford to make that move. Well, we can because it's such a small percentage uh, of our revenue source. $3,000 is, is, is absolutely nothing. But as we work to bring in more industry that is very energy dependent, that revenue could possibly go up. And so we don't want to be in a position where we're dependent on that revenue if we want to go back and take a look at eliminating the tax down the road. Now is the time to do it as we're trying to recruit those companies to Paulding and work with the existing industry to expand. And we do have a number of projects right now that are energy dependent. So I would encourage you all to support the repeal of the tax. I would encourage the cities to also do the same thing as well. So, I want to thank you for addressing this issue. Okay. Any other discussion on this issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Number two, discuss action to authorize the chairman to execute a contract amendment with Astro Group Incorporated in the amount of $252,177.16 for rock removal related to the construction of the West Memorial Sheriff's Training Facility, Joe Rand. Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. As you know, work continues out at the uh, the new training facility west of Dallas. And this agenda item this morning uh, addresses the rock removal related items. Uh, again, we're trying to adjust the contract amount uh, in the rock areas that we've uh, encountered is in the future building pad, the parking lot, and the relocated sanitary sewer line, and probably a few areas in the storm sewer uh, that we're currently under construction. Comprehensive program services work with our contractor, Astro Group, to develop these final costs that are included in your package today. The amount of the amendment is $252,177.16. The uh, revised project total with this amendment and the amendment from last month will bring the grand total to this contract of a little over close to $1.6 million. The amendment also includes an 18-day extension to the contract and the funding for this uh, original bid award and this amendment will come out of the swaps of proceeds. And in the back, if you'll see the recommendation letter from Conference Program Services, who is our construction manager on site. And I do have uh, Eric Johnson with CPS and audience today, along with the, uh, Alan Ison with Astro Group as well. If you have any questions, I can take those. If you remember, um, we're having to build a new sheriff's training facility because the current uh, facility is on the edge uh, of a landfill. Uh, the EPD uh, has warranted that it's 
not allowed any longer. And so uh, we're back to, because of the uh, EPD uh, building a new training facility, uh, we chose to build this on uh, some land that the Industrial Building Authority had acquired. Uh, it was uh, de-annexed out of the uh, city of uh, Dallas. And uh, it allows the uh, sheriff uh, to also, uh, with a notice, uh, to allow Hiram and Dallas to both become and train there. Uh, so I'm excited. Anything you want to talk about in the center itself? I, I have a question for Chuck. Uh, the, in, in the amount that you have, now I notice there is $71,000 for rock allowance. In other words, the others are firm numbers that we got to pay, but 71000 is, or have we already got to the point that now we know we've got to pay yet? No, that is that is an allowance in the contract that we're trying to acquire for the uh, sanitary sewer line relocation, and we haven't gotten into that area yet, so this is an allowance, assuming approximately half of that line is in trench rock and it's trench rock only. So there's three different types. There's the river pool, there's the mass rock, and trench rock. And so that's an allowance just to hopefully cover those costs. And as we get into that material, it's approved uh, by our third party testing team and our construction manager. We'll address that as it comes up. Okay. All right. But now this, the, the relocation of sanitary sewer is already bid and is already part of the contract. It is part of the so contract. So this is just an allowance in case they get robbed so that you don't have to come back. That is correct. In which we know there's rock back. We've proven it. Yes. See. Okay. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, Gary. Sheriff, sure you want to add a few things? I, you're trying to uh, I guess this is one of those things that I get involved with. A good deed goes unpunished. Uh, I didn't know that they were rocking the ground. Of course, you need to know you start looking. Uh, since I've been in Boyd's Sheriff's Office for 24 years, this will be the third training center we've built. We've always built on worried land, which makes us have to leave when people get tired of us. Of course, they need this time to run this out. Uh, they won't make that thing. They got to go ahead and put dirt over the top of it, put a ladder down. Uh, you're not allowed to have any trees growing on it. You can't put any holes in the ground, which means you can't shoot the ground, which is what we do every day. Uh, the training center will be open, as always, to the hiring Dallas. Uh, we open our training center up to anybody that wants to come train. Uh, I think this will be a great project. I think it'll be a good thing once we get done. We have, and I know most people don't know what we have. Right now, we're in two mobile homes that was donated to us. We need them make labor to remodel. They're not nice, but they serve the purpose. We want to build a building that we can get in and have enough room to meet, where we can have enough breakout training rooms so we can train. Uh, it will have a 20 lane firing range where the, the deputies can go, deputies and city police officers can all uh, fire their weapons. There'll be a 400 yard rifle range where the, their SWAT team can train, their snipers can train. Uh, it's located on land that is a default subdivision. Uh, we actually bought the land with supplies money, so it'll be, it'll, it'll be our property. Hopefully, we won't ever have to leave again. Anything y'all got, I'll try to answer for you. As far as training at night, are we doing any of that? Or is it everything? We're required to do some low light training. We will try to be as friendly as possible to neighborhoods. We've, we've been able to survive for years over at Midwater Cedar Ridge area. Sometimes we're not good neighbors because we make noise. We've learned as we go. We tried to have low light fire one time early in the morning. That had to go over real well, so we don't do that anymore. Our, our low light fire will be in the earliest, in the earliest part of the evening as soon as it gets dark. We are required to fire in the dark. So some of it will be at night, but most of it will be in the daytime. In Wednesdays is our SWAT training, our K-9 training days, and that will probably be the last day we got. Uh, we'll do our best to be a good neighbor, but we understand that we're noisy. Uh, it can't be helped. We have to shoot guns. That's what we do. Any other questions? I'll lean up mine. He doesn't have his glasses. <laughs> I don't have to leave. This is all up here. I've got a question. And I, don't, I don't have Commissioner Graham's broken out numbers. All I see is the $252,000. That's a quarter of a million dollars. Um, since that's not part of the Astra Group contract right now, why would we not bid out the rock removal at, at that cost? The other component to this contract is did take bids. We knew that we were going to encounter rock on site, so the way we handled that is we took uh, we took submitted prices and negotiated prices up front. So those those costs, those unit items are already built into the contract. 
course, at the time when we had went to bid, we didn't have a volume to put with the numbers. But the numbers are in line with with what uh, with what we would see on a, on a normal work job. Right. And and the, that volume is verified by a third party. It's not asterisk number. Like, it's that, not out there just with we a have third, child clicking off. That's that's right. We have a third party team that's involved that accounts for that. We just don't take the work. Okay. Thank both of you. Uh, May the 10th uh, will be the opening uh, of our new uh, Veterans Park out front. Uh, it's going to be uh, quite a day uh, to honor the veterans. Uh, I couldn't be uh, happier about the opening of the park. So if you would join us at 10 o'clock on May the 10th for the opening of the Veterans Park, it'll be a, a great day for Pauling County. Michael Justice going to prepare hot dogs for us. Yes, uh, Michael will have uh, hot dogs uh, out here as uh, several sponsors for that day. Uh, so we're pretty excited about being able to uh, honor our veterans. Uh, that is the conclusion of our regular business session. Did you get uh, There's no executive uh, session. Uh, citizen wishing to speak, Mr. K.B. Coggins, the Industrial Building Authority and the Air Force. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak again. And I am in hopes that when this new resolution is passed, that we'll continue to have this opportunity. Commissioners, over the past few months, a lot of controversy has arisen as a result of some actions of the IBA has undertaken as it relates to the airport and some of the secret off-site meetings and other issues the IBA and the Airport Authority have been in, involved in. Some of you have implied that you have no control over them other than through the budget process. Fact is, some of you commissioners have expressed during recent Board of Commissioners meetings your disapproval of some of the things the IBA and the Airport Authority have done and during the very same meeting, voted to fund airport projects totaling several million dollars for completion of some projects that was begun without proper funding in place to complete the project. The money, this money came directly out of the general fund and must be replaced either through budget cuts or increased taxes on this next budget year. Commissioners, instead of Instead of re reining in two out-of-control authorities, you then proposed Resolution 1405, which for all intent and purposes expanded the powers and duties of the IBA. Here again, someone secretly made a deal with Howard Maxwell to fast-track legislation that would expand the duties and responsibilities of the IBA. This is a matter of record and was brought to the attention of this commission just recently by Commissioner Todd Parnell. Commissioners, I propose it, that this commission submit, submit a resolution to the next General Assembly to eliminate completely the Industrial Building Authority along with the County Airport Authority and that a public hearing be held on this issue to get citizens' input, both pro and con, on the issue. Both of these authorities have reached their maximum usefulness and are no longer providing useful services to the citizens of Fallon County and have now become a liability due to the tens of millions of dollars that both of these authorities have placed the taxpayers in debt for. A review of the most recent balance sheet reveals that the IBA has indebted every taxpayer citizen in this county to the tune of $23 million. And this total time, every time that you approve another bond issue or agree to assume another contract for the airport authority. A review of the most recent balance sheet for the IBA for April of 2014 reveals that a bond was issued in 2011 
for the film studio in the amount of six million three hundred eighty two thousand five hundred and twenty nine dollars and fifty eight cents the same balance sheet has the total value of the film studio listed as one million three hundred and twenty three thousand one hundred and eighty eight dollars and thirty one cents surely the value of the film studio has not depreciated over five million dollars in three short years is a forensic audit of the book, books of the IBA and the, and the airport authority necessary in order to assure that bond dollars are being properly spent for what they were approved for. Even though the citizens were promised that the airport would not cost a taxpayer one red cent, we have now become aware that at least eight to ten million Paulin County tax dollars have been spent in addition to the 50 million plus in state and federal tax dollars, with another 38 million being proposed in a five-year budget. Commissioners, time to do what is right for the citizens. Eliminate the two authorities of which you have admitted that you have no control of. Thank you very much.
counter-revolution must start at the bottom as citizens begin to reclaim their natural rights and to put into place the proper structure of authority derived from those natural rights endowed by our creator. To the county employees, many citizens are aware of your plight under this administration, and while we are sympathetic, it is time to grow some cojones, stand up, speak out, organize yourselves, and realize that there is strength in numbers. Join the citizens of the county revolution to put into place the proper structure of authority derived from natural rights. To my public servants, it is time you understand the proper order of things and the consequences for not abiding by the natural order of power. For if we don't, our grandchildren may be working and living in a dystopian Agenda 21 complex akin to a Foxconn plant, standing in front of a flag saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag of, insert the name of your favorite Fortune 100 company, and to the hypocrisy for which it stands, under mammon, stock dividends, authority, and impunity for few. As a nation, we are entitled to more than this future. Let's work together towards changing things now. Thank you.